So we're uh, about to begin this uh, session on data refineries. Please uh, find a place to settle. So welcome uh, to this session. Uh, my name is Russ Taylor. I'm an astrophysicist from the University of Calgary. And I have, uh, I'm here at this meeting by virtue of the fact that I work on trying to meet the challenge of the large data that's being produced by astronomers around the world. And that's growing exponentially over the next decade. And I'll tell you a bit about that tomorrow in the, in the closing um, panel. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about the refinement of data this afternoon, or, or actually this morning. Um, now data is only as useful, of course, as your ability to extract uh, information and knowledge from it that uh, helps drive decisions. Uh, without that capacity, data just becomes a liability, and, and big data becomes a, a big liability. Um, so um, uh, creating the data, uh, in fact, is the easiest part, I think, in this information chain. Uh, it's almost happening by default by the growth of information technologies, which are generating larger data streams that have to go somewhere. And they get stored in big data vaults. And the challenge then is to, is to use that data sensibly to, um, to guide uh, knowledge. So uh, we're going to have a session devoted to data refineries. Our first speaker is uh, Osmar Zayan, uh, who's at the University of Alberta, has been there for 13 years, he tells me and uh, working in uh, ways to mine data from uh, databases. And he's going to talk to us today about that. Thank you. Oops. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, but it's tough to come and talk to you just after Andrew. That was an exciting uh, talk. And I'll try to make it easier for the next speakers. Um, <laughs> Well, um, yesterday, for those who were here, we had a plenary session talking about whether data is the next oil. It's this interesting metaphor. I don't particularly like it because it assumes data will replace oil. Uh, it's not the case, even though, well, data will become uh, uh, an important uh, source or drive for many businesses that may be as profitable as uh, oil. but. Um, we use a lot of metaphors, unfortunately, like for example, we talk about big data and we equate it to a tsunami. A tsunami is a big wave and we have this big wave coming at us indeed, but uh, if you survive the tsunami, the oceans are calm afterwards. It's not the case for big data. Uh, you have to stay afloat and it continues to come, so it's not the right metaphor. Uh, this session is called uh, Raw Data Refineries, and again a link with oil, I guess. Uh, and the refineries here are the analytics you can do, this is what I understand from this uh, metaphor, the, the analytics that you can do on big data. But again, I don't necessarily agree with uh, the metaphor. Um, with oil, you have a pipeline coming in with crude oil, and um, so imagine one unique big pipeline coming in and you have many other pipelines coming out with different kinds of uh, fuel, whether it is uh, kerosene, diesel, heavy diesel, whatever, you name it. Um, when you talk to big data, it's mirrored, it's the other way around. Um, and rem remember these two criticisms of these metaphors, the tsunami and this one, because it's very important. Um, in big data, you don't have one big pipeline coming in. By definition, you have many pipelines coming in with different kinds of crude oil. And one pipeline coming out, which is hopefully the knowledge that you can get, the insights you can get from all these different um, pipelines. Anyways, that's why I'm, uh, I'm saying it's a, it's a mirror. Anyways, uh, what I'll be talking about is basically um, what I call um, big data, and I will um, give examples so that you can better relate to this big data. And I'll talk about the challenges that we have, because yes, big data is already here, but it's not a done deal. We have many challenges in front of us uh, in, in terms of refinery, if you want to talk about refinery. 
So uh, yesterday, uh, also uh, Bill Hutchinson, the president of uh, iCanada, mentioned the Harvard Business Review. Um, so indeed, the uh, Harvard Business Review has uh, an article about uh, data scientists being uh, the sexiest job in the 21st century. Um, so I, I, I actually uh, believe indeed that data scientists and data analysts will be very important. Um, <clears throat> so if you have kids, uh, teenage uh, kids, uh, if they tell you I want to become a doctor, I want to become a pilot, tell them, hey, there's something more exciting. Um, <clears throat> but the reason why people are talking about this uh, fantastic job of the 21st century, it's because of another report, the McKinsey report last year, um, in the sixth um, point, they, they mentioned the fact that uh, in the US alone, um, we'll have a significant shortage of uh, data scientists, uh, about 100,000 of them. That's huge. Uh, that means that we have, we'll have more data than we can uh, uh, analyze. And it's already the case. Uh, if you look at NASA, um, one of the main reasons they embarked on this open data initiative with OpenGov is because they admitted they can't handle all the data they get from all the different probes they have, all the different programs they have, and they provide it for free. And uh, they hope that crowdsourcing will help them uh, uh, analyze some of this data. So uh, since we all will become data analysts, actually it's not just data analysts. The uh, McKinsey report uh, uh, mentions the fact that uh, also the, the managers have to become data savvy. Uh, data savvy means that they need to know uh, what's the data available, uh, how they can use it, and uh, what they hopefully can get out of that in order to be able to really take advantage of the data that we have. Um, so since uh, data analysis is, is important, we have to start learning a new language, new vocabulary uh, in this world of big data. And uh, long gone are the days when we were talking about megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes. Now we are already in the level of exabytes and soon we'll go up the scale with zettabyte and, and yottabytes. What are these numbers? Uh, just uh, to help you visualize what these big numbers are, it's very difficult actually to imagine. Um, I'm a swimmer, um, so uh, I, I like making uh, analogies with that world. So imagine a swimming pool, an Olympic swimming pool. It's 50 meters long by 25 meters wide. It has 10 lanes. Uh, they keep two lanes on the uh, <clears throat> extremity, so we reduce the waves and stuff like that during the competition. It's a very large swimming pool. We don't have many of them in Alberta, actually. I know in Edmonton we have the Kinsman, which is a, a real Olympic swimming pool. Um, the depths vary, and uh, there's a minimum depth, but um, uh, if you think about that swimming pool, that huge swimming pool, um, it has about the capacity is about 2,500,000 liters. Okay. Um, a liter is about 20,000 drops. So if you count the number of drops in an Olympic swimming pool, you reach 500 billion drops. We're not in the teradrops yet. Yet we're talking about terabytes of data. So that gives you an idea about the size. Um, <clears throat> Um, are we there yet? Yes, um, <clears throat> this is coming from uh, slides that uh, The Economist put last year, put up last year, so I, I, I <clears throat> put their logo there, but they uh, mentioned a report from uh, EMC uh, calculating, estimating the size of the global data today, and uh, we are in the order of 130 exabytes. So this is data that is also copied, replicated, and all that stuff. So all the data that we have, because we copy data, we change it and store it again and so forth. Um, <clears throat> they estimate by 2015, we'll reach almost 8,000 exabytes. So this is, this is phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, 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 it's actually larger twice as large as the number of stars, physical stars, 
in the physical universe. So it gives you an, an idea about this size. So why, why are we in this state? Um, again, from the same slides, uh, and, and Ian talked about yesterday the, the cost of uh, storage when he showed his floppy disk, how uh, that floppy disk costed uh, uh, $3 in the 70s, and had he bought a, a USB key, the same that he bought uh, a month ago, a week ago, it would have cost millions of dollars. Indeed, the cost is dropping dramatically, and this is just um, <clears throat> for the cost of a gigabyte today, one gigabyte is less than a dollar. And at the same time, the investment by industry for storage and, and management of data has doubled in, in 10 years. So that means we have more ways more, uh, we can store more data, and we do, we don't throw anything, okay, Any, everything we keep it. Um, <clears throat> so the biggest, I would say, um, data points, the biggest uh, source of data points, uh, um, apart from video, of course, we have um, um, sensors. So the number of sensors in the world we live in is growing uh, exponentially. It is estimated uh, by 2015, uh, 645 million new sensors will be purchased, sold that year. Uh, and, and imagine all the other sensors still working and still sending data. Um, we have also uh, new means of collecting data, new means of uh, creating data. Um, Twitter is one of them. And Twitter is very useful um, and uh, useless at the same time. So we have to sift through this uh, mess. And uh, today, so this, this graph is about uh, the progress until 2010. But today, um, while well, I have the data as of June uh, 2012, we are creating 400 million tweets every single day. That's, that's phenomenal. And as I said, some of it is useful. Um, I should go faster. So what is big data? Big data to me, what, what uh, big data means to somebody may not uh, necessarily mean the same thing to somebody else. Uh, <clears throat> so here's the, the um, fire hose of data. Actually, maybe we should say the uh, high pressure pipeline of data coming in. <clears throat> and basically big data, um, it's not just the size. I've been talking about the size, size, size. It's not just uh, the size. It's also the fact that it's complex. It's so complex that it becomes actually very difficult to challenge uh, for the current tools to manage all this. Capture it, store it, and manage it, and then analyze it. This is what we're talking about, the refinery. Um, why are we talking about complexity? Well, the complexity comes from the fact that it is uh, coming from different sources completely independent sources, and, and uh, uh, they're considered silos, basically. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's complex because the flow is nonstop. It continues to come at, at, uh, at high speed, high, high capacity. Um, <clears throat> so big data is more than just uh, uh, a matter of size. It's a continuous flow. Um, it's a big data stream. Um, <clears throat> no one ever wants to throw anything. We'll start. Maybe I'll use it tomorrow. Uh, um, and these sources are completely independent. And sometimes they're not even yours. If I want to use Twitter, it's not my source of data. I'm using another source. And with open data, I have now the ability to use data f coming from other sources that I have no control over. Um, yet. Um, I have to integrate it with my own data in order to get insights. And I think the, the key word from my talk at, at the end, what the message that I want you to, to keep is the fact that um, value in data is created with the integration. So it's the integration that actually creates the value in the data. So it's very important to look at all these sources. Um, and when you have different sources coming from different places, you have heterogeneity. And the heterogeneity is not just in the type, but it can be semantic heterogeneity. And the semantic heterogeneity is, is a very tough uh, problem. Um, <clears throat> so often we associate big data with unstructured da data. It's not necessarily all of it unstructured, but um, a, a big chunk of it is indeed unstructured. So, there are many challenges. The fact that it's large, it, it comes at uh, a constant flow 24-7. Um, 
So we need to talk, think about infrastructure, we need to think about fault tolerance. I need to be able to continue to collect the data and continue to analyze it even if my components fail. Okay. Um, so in industry they talk about the three V's, sometimes the four V's, so I'll explain what are these V's. Um, <clears throat> these are the, th the four dimensions of big data. A volume is number one because typically big data is indeed big uh, in size um, <clears throat> and we continue to amass a, a large uh, quantity of it. So imagine uh, you're dealing with Twitter, I mentioned Twitter, uh, imagine you want to understand um, what do people think about your product um, and, and that, that sentiment about the product changes in time. So you have to continuously uh, deal with that and look at all these tweets and analyze uh, their opinion. So where there's, a, uh, there's a field called opinion mining. Um, <clears throat> velocity, the second uh, uh, V, uh, has to do with the fact that uh, not only the data comes at a high speed, but also I have to analyze it and make decisions very fast. So imagine again here I have another example with uh, a large number of uh, uh, calls that are happening in the telecom um, <clears throat> network and I have to look at all this coming non-stop and decide real time before it happens so predict whether I'll have some churning and then act upon that uh, uh, early. Um, variety is the third V and I mentioned is the fact that we have different silos uh, and they're completely different uh, and you can have you can deal with text like uh, uh, with Twitter you can deal with sensor data uh, you have transactions of your own customers you have uh, multimedia you have click streams from the web and so forth so um, again another example with variety imagine you want to you try to identify fraud in um, financial transactions, looking at only the transactions themselves may, not, may help, but it's not enough. You need to look at uh, emails, memos, and, and all the things and, and integrate them together, link them together to have a better insight. So you need that variety. And then finally, another V that uh, often people forget is veracity. Um, so you need to be able to uh, make sense out of that outcome from the analysis. That refinery gives you the different products, and go back to the refinery because that's the title and the metaphor we're using, well you have to see whether that product is useful uh, and for that you have to trust it. And the trust is a very important uh, um, thing here because knowing, for example, data coming from different sensors, um, sensors are not 100% uh, sure. You don't, you, sometimes you are uncertain about the values that are returned by the sensors. Same thing with the information coming from Twitter. You don't know who wrote it and so forth. So um, it is very important to be able to um, trust the results and the, the decision maker needs to um, have access to uh, um, other information to basically give evidence for these patterns or whatever uh, um, uh, regularities that the analysis uh, gave. Okay, so what are the phases in big data? So you have the acquisition of data, you have uh, the extraction and the cleaning of that data, uh, and then you have to integrate all this, and then later you have to put it in a format that can be uh, useful uh, for the analysis. And then before you do the analysis, I put modeling before the analysis, and this is something that often people uh, uh, forget to mention, but it is a very big challenge. And finally, the, the, the uh, final challenge is the interpretation of whatever you, whatever you get. So why modeling? So uh, imagine, take another example um, with Twitter. You're trying to uh, predict um, the value of some stock uh, of a company. Um, before it goes up or before it goes down. So you can look at the data coming from the stock market, um, but as you know, many people have tried it. It's not that easy. It's better to um, um, look at how people think about that company and how people think about the products of that company. So you may look at Twitter. So uh, you have this flow of data coming from Twitter uh, or other blogs. and. Um, 
But you have to ask yourself the question, should I store everything? Or should I put filters at the source and decide to only store the tweets that talk about that particular company and the products of that particular company? That's an interesting question. Uh, once you have that answer, then each tweet that you end up storing, do you store the whole tweet or the whole blog, or do you store the information just before and after the term that you're interested in? Uh, basically, what are the terms that are relevant in deciding whether somebody like, is liking it or disliking it? So this opinion, positive or negative. All that is part of the modeling of your data, and that is not trivial. Of course, it depends upon the task that you're trying to do. Uh, but it has to be considered early on. The other thing that needs to be considered early on is what we call metadata. Um, the description of the data that you're storing and the description of the data that you will be mining because that description, that metadata is capital later on when you're trying to interpret whatever you extracted. Oh my, I have to go faster. Okay. There's similarity with open data. I think, unfortunately, I have to skip. I, I talk too much, so <laughs> bear with me. I think I'll go to the examples where you'll better relate uh, this message that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to convey, that the, the, uh, the value is in the integration. I'll give you examples. So, so the example here is um, coming from complex net, uh, 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 networks or some people call it social networks, social network analysis. So this is a tool we developed at AICML doing some uh, um, <clears throat> analysis of complex networks. So here's the example. Imagine you have a company that uh, sells uh, plans for cell phones. Um, periodically, you have to check the file of your customers who have to renew their plan and make a decision. The decision is, should I keep these customers or let them go? There's a lot of competition. They may actually churn and go elsewhere. But sometimes you don't care about them because you're not making money out of them. But if you're making money out of them, you want to give them incentives and st to stay. So here's a hypothetical uh, uh, database where I have um, 19 customers. And I can see in my table, this is a typical relational table. I have their name, their phone number, and all that stuff. But also I have a very important information here that tells me how much money I made in the last three months. So one very easy action I can do, I can sort this uh, uh, file and can see that I have some people sorted based on the profit that I make, and I can see that I'm losing on some people and making way more money on others. And I may decide, okay, uh, if I'm making less than 50 bucks, then I can let them go. The others, I should give them incentives. It sounds logical, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it's the wrong decision. Um, so why is it the wrong decision? Well, if you get extra information, Oops. The extra information is looking at the other customers, bundle them with these people. So how do I bundle them? Well, uh, basically, who calls who? And I can see that these people that have to renew their, their plan also are calling other people that are also my customers. And I can also include other data about the frequency, who calls who, but how often, and all that stuff. And I can create a complex network. And then if I position these six people that I wanted to let go on the global network, I realize, well, some, some of them seem to be central in that network. Um, <clears throat> so maybe it's the wrong decision indeed. So let's dig deeper. This is the global network. Uh, we can do what we call community mining. So finding, uh, actually before community mining, we can actually visualize them. And uh, uh, if I had time, I would call, talk more about visualization because that's very important in the interpretation of the, the results you get from your refinery. Uh, so here's a visualization where I can place the different uh, nodes in my graph in a cocentric uh, uh, circle uh, or set of circles, and the people in the center are more important, let's call them, with different measures of uh, centrality. Uh, here I'm using page rank. And if I put now my six people there, and I see, yeah, some people are actually peripheral. So I can let them go. Okay, oops, there's one that is very central, the most central in my global network. So maybe I should dig deeper. So to dig deeper, what we'll do, and actually that too, uh, central, we'll do some community mining. Community mining is finding groups that communicate with each, uh, each, each other inside the group more often than outside. 
and I realize that I have four groups. And if I place my six people, and I'll see that they are in two different groups. And I can do the same exercise group by group. And I realize, yeah, some people are yeah, peripheral on that group. There's one person that is very central in that group. It means that if I let go, that's Natalie, if I let her go, the potential loss is $3,000 because their friends may leave as well. It, the whole network collapses if they leave. And the same happens with the, net, with the other uh, community. I have people that are peripheral, but there's John here who is uh, relatively central, so the potential loss is $6,000. So my decision now is different. I have two that I should keep and give them incentives to stay, even though individually I lose money on them, and the others, it's okay, I can let them go. So this shows you that combining data together allows you to have better insight that you wouldn't have if you don't combine the data. I have other examples, but for lack of time, you can ask me questions. <laughs> for lack of time, unfortunately, I can't cover them. This is a, a project with uh, Alberta Health Services where we are collecting data from the emergency department. These are texts, like the, uh, um, the discharge reports. We have health link transcripts and data from elementary schools in order to combine all this to discover the onset of an outbreak so that epidemiologists can dig deeper and then send warnings to the public, to the hospitals, to the government and so forth. Um, I have other examples, collect combining data as well from uh, health authorities, from uh, a national, so this is open source national pollutant release inventory and uh, state, uh, the Environment Canada data and agriculture here in, in Alberta in order to identify, so put them all together and identify associations between chemical pollutants and uh, cancer with children. Uh, so, um, okay, I think I'll go to the end where I have my summary. So the summary is that big data is not just the size, it's the, the fact that it's a con conglomeration of different completely independent data sources and they come at a high speed and they will never stop. You can't ask it to stop, let me finish my analysis and then bring me the rest. No, it never stops. So it has to be very fast. Data integration is the creator of value. Um, <clears throat> so data uh, analytics on this big data is what will help uh, uncover the hidden knowledge in this, uh, on these silos. Um, but there are many, many challenges. So there's the infrastructure, of course, but uh, we're still at the beginning of building tools that are appropriate for this heterogeneous world uh, in terms of data analytics. And that's one reason why we need a lot of these data uh, scientists. And modeling is capital, we should not forget it. Um, <clears throat> metadata is also capital, uh, we should not forget it. And finally, uh, data analytics on big data also requires the interpretation at the end. It's useless if you can't really interpret it down the road. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, this might be uh, part of the um, slides we need to cover, but um, are we getting close to the stage of machines being able to draw these relationships between different uh, data sources and different um, you know, data sets um, so that it's no longer a case of uh, people having to manually define that, but rather being able to define it uh, automatically through uh, machines? Yes, definitely. So there, there are... Um techniques to uh, um, find these linkages. Um, there are many tools that we're building also for data integration dealing with heterogeneity. Um, there are also tools to uh, automatically, well, we're just at the beginning, but the automatically generate metadata as well, the description of the data, um, because that's a tedious task too. And it'll take time, if you do it manually, it'll take time, and by the time you finish, you have more data coming in. Um, <clears throat> yes, there are tools but we need more robust tools. So we're still working on it. Yes? One more question? If not, uh, thank you again, Dr. Mark. Thank you. Talk to, talk to you after the session for lunch. For our next, uh, our next
speaker in this session is Elmo Barranco Mendoza, who is the Chief Marketing Information Officer for Nerd Force, which is a global technology and cloud solutions company provider. Um, she graduated from Trinity Western University and uh, lives in gender studies, and she's co founded a company called Infogenetica Bioinformatics, which is a medical bioinformatics research and consulting group where she serves as president and CEO since 2003. And today, um, just to clarify, actually, I was the CIO at Trinity Western University for the last eight years. So, um, a part of, of um, I graduated from Simon Fraser University, where I did my PhD actually with Osmar. So uh, we get we know each other for quite a few years. Okay, so uh, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is following on to Osmar's presentation of what is big data. Um, I completely agree with his uh, mention that really the big oil is is not the best analogy when it comes to to data itself. Because um, really, the, uh, we have very, very many different sources of information coming in at different cases and so on. And most of us don't quite even grasp what data looks at like in our organizations. So um, usually we see mountains of information ahead of us when we come in, uh, in, in our organizations and we think that is the data. However, in reality, the analogy I like to use better is more like an iceberg. There's a lot, a lot of information that we don't even perceive. And you have different groups providing different data, creating different data. You have a couple of clouds here and there. You have the individuals producing their own little data in their own machines. We have our researchers. We have our marketing departments, and so on. And all of this information needs to be interacting with each other, whether we know it or not, especially within a university. That was one of the greatest challenges when I came in at Trinity Western a number of years ago, that everybody who, who, with whom I talked to, their thing was, oh, I am interested in finding out how many students we have, but we don't have that information complete. Because enrollment management has some numbers, but graduate studies has a different number, and extensions has a different number, and they all are generating all this data, which if we don't have the proper technologies to analyze, we don't even know how many full-time students we have at the university for real, you know, because you count it in different ways. So I'm very pleased to have uh, my talk being after Osmar, because I will not do the definition of the data. He explained it quite well, and I'm thankful, because there's a lot of other things that we should be looking at. And I'm going to be focusing on the area of governance and information and strategy. Um, as that was quite a bit of my experience, um, I, I've been dealing with data for a long time, and in, I played many different roles as a scientist myself. I, I, part of my research was in medical informatics. Uh, Andrew, I will be talking to you about that prize because my research was actually on uh, medical diagnosis on the cell phone. So, you know, that, that's, that's an, a very exciting uh, area of research that, you know, requires an extensive amount of data to be interacting with each other. And, you know, I was uh, actually a, a software developer where we were doing BI solutions for telecommunications. And, and now I'm a service provider. So um, there is a number of areas that, you know, I can see that the, this problem, I understand my customers now because I, I know what, it, what their needs are. And within the university, that was one of the challenges because researchers, they want their data. Here, now, give me the space I need to store my terabytes of biological data, but they don't realize of the old infrastructural needs behind all that requirement, uh, the same that the university requires to have their enrollment data, and the president needs his email who lost three months ago to be recovered because it's critical for the success of the university. So um, although there are a number of challenges that we have dealing with big data. So um, Osmar explained very well the problem with capture. There are 
you have to do a lot of processing to have data that is actually going to be meaningful for your institution. Storage is another big challenge because think about the volume of terabytes, petabytes, and exabytes of information that needs to be backed. That, you know, uh, researchers rarely think about that, but very often they come to you in your IT department saying, hey, remember that research I was working on two years ago? There is a data says that, you know, my research assistant erased, can I get a copy? You know, and this is one of our 500 uh, professors working on research, and obviously the, the expectation of you know, being able to restore all that data in itself is, becomes nightmarish. Um, searching again, finding through all these millions and millions and millions of data elements, which ones we are going to be restoring. At the same time, all this sharing of information between departments, between schools. Um, a Canary and a, is a very exciting a, initiative a, with uh, Universities sharing information amongst each other, who, the members of, of uh, the different research organizations and so on, and they're providing a beautiful pipeline for us to transfer data back and forth. But wh what is the smart way of doing so? It's a real challenge for, for a CIO and the different research groups within the university to be able to, to, to do the best utilization of the resources, because even though prices are coming down for storage and whatever not, it's not free. And this is one of the things that uh, organizations and, and researchers and all the, the different stakeholders of, of an organization need to be very aware of because um, I love the analogy of the uh, big data being like big sugar. We're so glutton for, for data. We, you know, and, and give me more, give me more, and now that I have more, I want more, and, and now that we have the data, you need to find the piece of information that we need. Well, that is not simple, and that's where analytics come into play. That is an element that is so important. However, doing analytics for analytics sake, if you do not have a proper strategy to develop this, we could be gathering a lot of information that is false or that can lead us in, in routes that uh, are not the most effective or most beneficial for our organization. And finally, uh, like the area of visualization, as Osman was briefly mentioning, I wish you could have been able to talk more about this, because it's extremely important. A lot of the times when we do an analysis of information, and um, an example could be in the medical field, um, you saw some, some of the graphs um, that how you provide your information for DNA analysis. One of our customers was AgriFood Canada in, uh, through Infogenetica. And the research that we're looking at fungi DNA, I'm looking for homologies on the different uh, pieces of fungi. It was so important for us to be able to have a proper visualization methodology for, for us to quickly identify because it, all right, we could align the, the sequences pretty fast, but for a researcher to just go in and being able to find what were the areas in common and how relevant that was for them, it was difficult. So uh, visualization became actually the most difficult problem, not so much the alignment, uh, so that the, the information that we identified was usable. So finally, governance. And I think, I say finally, but it actually should be the very first thing that an organization needs to do in the development of their information strategy. So when I talk of governance, there are really two pieces to it. One is performance management and data governance. And this needs to come in hand in hand because it, one without the other, it gives you an incomplete picture of what an organization data strategy really is. So by performance management, what I'm talking about is the practice of articulating, communicating, and measuring the achievements of an organization's strategic objectives. What do we want to accomplish as an institution? And that needs to be a common theme, an umbrella of the institution, for us to be actually effective in utilizing our information. Then in terms of the data governance, is really 
not just the individual pieces of data, but it's overseeing people. Don't forget the people. At the end of the day, data is great, but we are working with human beings. That's what we want to, to deal with. And uh, you know, scientists, sometimes we get really, really, really excited about our data and like, our algorithms and our programming is just awesome. And we forget that there is a person behind all of this that actually wants to utilize this information for some particular purpose. So the people that are part of this, the systems, Many of them, data is coming in from many different sources. So, you know, for us to be able to break a piece of this big iceberg, we need to think of all the pieces. And also processes, which is, again, one of the big challenges of organizations. So all those uh, put together uh, define, help us define a strategy that uh, is going to allow us to make decisions that are effective for our organization. So, this is really a corporate strategy, and I realize that, especially in universities, this is uh, the holy grail, and difficult, difficult, difficult to achieve because we have many very powerful groups within an organization. It's not as easy as corporate structures where you know we have a CEO who makes the final decisions and so on, but. Um, you know, in, in universities, you have the students' associations, faculty, uh, alumni, you name it. So you have many different groups. But at the end of the day, you do have an executive group who is, one, who is the one who's going to define the strategy for the organization. Um, then you have your functional managers who are going to be the ones who need to align their, their departments or their divisions to this uh, corporate strategy. Then you have your analysts, and these are not necessarily just IT personnel, or you, you have analysts in every single uh, functional area of your institution. There are the people who are looking at the data. They're lo looking at the functions, and they're analyzing what is going to happen next. So it could be your manager. It could be sometimes the administrative assistant ends up being the analyst in a particular department, because they are the ones who have the bigger picture of what is happening. Then you have everybody who executes. So those are our employees, our customers. Hey, Facebook guys, <laughs> Twitter. If you are a company and you are not looking at your social media and what your customers are saying, you're lost because you are part of social media whether you like it or not. So if you don't have a social media strategy within your organization, your customers are going to define your social media strategy, and good chances are that it's going to be bad for you. You know, unless you are a superstar at customer service. But by the fact that you don't have a social media strategy, good chances are that you're not doing such a spectacular job. Um, then uh, you also have your partner organizations, and finally, the governance piece. And these are your data stewards, which not necessarily have to be leaving all of them in your IT department again. You have data stewards in all areas of the organization. So we have professors like Osmar, who he is the data steward of his department, and he's producing tons and tons and tons of data. Uh, we have uh, you know, administrative assistants, as I said. You have uh, every department should have a designated data steward who be able to be the contact person that will be able to direct the flow of information so that aligns with that strategic objective for the whole organization. So what type of questions do we need to ask? When, when we're strategizing, we have to, who do we want to be? So NERFORCE is your local technology department. That's very clear. We know who we are. Uh, there are companies that don't even know what they are. So by that knowledge, that needs to drive the whole strategy of what we do as an organization to be able to accomplish that final goal. So what are our highest measures of success? Well, we want a, a part of the market share uh, in, that, in the, our particular space. So what are we going to achieve? So by being local uh, your local technology department, well, we need to abide by, for example, since we're cloud providers, one of the objectives as we come into Canada is abide by Canadian uh, privacy regulations, so data residing within Canada, addressing the needs of our Canadian partners. Uh, 
which, you know, is sometimes, you know, providers may not be thinking in those terms, like, oh, yeah, let's go. But as a university, I come and I want to buy cloud solutions. And where is your backup? I have to be honest with you, I don't know, maybe in China, maybe in the UK. We have, that is not addressing my needs as a Canadian university, because it's, uh, it's not part of my regulatory compliance. Um, then we have uh, the part of the alignment is what do we need to do well in order to contribute to our organizational success? So me as an IT department, Trinity Western University, for example, you know, we, part of our goal to, to be a multidisciplinary uh, uh, university is a, uh, Liberal arts and sciences, there's a lot of interaction within different departments. Therefore, we want the central IT department. So what do we do that? Well, we then ended up centralizing everybody. And it was not a simple task. But we were able to do that because that was part of the organizational objective. Um, now, uh, it's, sometimes it's not simple, but uh, if we have a very clear institutional strategy, then managers are able to align their own uh, individual plans and, and strategies uh, to align to that. Now, middle management, uh, they do what decisions most influence positive results, again, through that line of questions. Um, and the executioners, which process must influence the bottom line and how could we do better? So, you know, individual performance reviews and so on. And uh, how are we doing our, our work is going to be helping this. So, you know, decision makers uh, who are executioners, you know, like our faculty members, I often, as when I was the CIO at Trinity, I, I sat with them pretty frequently to identify what were their needs and how we could align my data strategy with their data needs so that we could find a solution corporately that rather than an individual basis, which ends up being less effective and a lot more costly for the organization. Um, and finally, the governance piece with our data stores, which uh, we want to identify which data elements are most critical in the alignment, execution, and optimization of the strategy. And this is definitely not simple. You all are people who dealt with data on a day-to-day -day basis. You know this. What is important? <laughs> what is going to help us identify which data elements are the ones that we really want to be able to back up for three years, as opposed to those ones that you know you have a weekly backup and that's it. So uh, that, that information is, is relevant, and, and knowing that point is critical. So to do that, analysis is one of the areas that is actually quite necessary to be able to do a good and, uh, use of, of data within our institution. So um, as I say, it's, it's looking at the raw data and finding conclusions that are going to help our institution. And that is really our goal. We want to become better in whatever the goals that we, are, we set ourselves into. So, to be able to define a successful business intelligence strategy or analysis, or whatever you want to call it, this people utilize different terms. Um, first of all, you want to develop an information strategy, as I mentioned, uh, ideally a corporate wide. Otherwise, at least within your air functional area, you really should start looking at these different uh, strategies. Now, clearly define data, objectives, and scope. When I was a vendor of uh, business intelligence, for, uh, we worked in the telecommunications space. And one of the challenges is that telecommunication just give everything, everything. And this was very early on, like it was mid 90s. We were one of the very first online BI tools available. Right now, what you can see, tell us at ended up acquiring us. So their, their guided sales tool is what our company developed. And uh, they, uh, part of that it was, how can this information be useful for us corporately wise? And it turns out to be that it was being able to upsell to the customer. That was a brand new concept back then. And, when we, we started looking at the trends of sales of the different profiles of customers, we were able to predict 
what information was that? So we did need to look at every single piece of information that the telco had because it would have taken forever. A big part of you know, being an online sales tool requires us that to, to move very fast so you couldn't sit down for three days for the data to be processed and you know, to spew out, out of the terabyte. So you had to be able to narrow down and do localized queries to be able to, to provide the information could be done really fast and in a tiny manner. So once you have that, you want to define a business case that is relevant, accurate, consistent, and timely. And all of these will bring in together a good business case to implement the BI strategy. So finally, uh, there are certain areas to be avoided once you are developing your BI strategy. And these are the no's. Assuming that BI is a one-time project, this is a recurring exercise within an organization. And you can start, start small and then start growing within your organization once you prove the value of, of this solution. Building for a power user. Like, you don't want to use your more expert person and build it according to this one person because the average Joe will not use this solution. Then. Um, also, assuming that BI is a one-size-fits-all solution, if things work in my organization, they will not necessarily work in yours because we are different. Our strategy is different. So uh, even though we may belong to the same sector, there are unique identifiers for every institution. And we have to be able to capture that. Um, Another thing is becoming dazzled with dashboards. When I talk in Trinity to bring in BI, the first thing that the president is, what is my dashboard going to look like? <laughs> so visualization is very important, as I said, but is the last thing that you look at before we need to look at the strategy and everything else. Um, also, not having a single version of the truth. Osmar made a very good point on this, so I will not reiterate, but you know, just make sure that you do have a data mart or, uh, that will allow that. And finally, ignoring the data quality, which again, Osmar mentioned that, very important. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. So that's my presentation, and uh, you guys have any questions? I have a question for you as a university researcher. Uh, researchers don't generally like to be governed. Uh, there's, there's always a conflict between the needs of the researcher and the corporation to manage the data. Do you have a, a solution for that particular area? Uh, that is a very good question. And actually, before being the CIO at Trinity, I, I, I was a professor. I, I retained my faculty status. And uh, I think it was very strategic of the university the, the fact of putting a researcher as the head of IT, because I have quite a bit of buy-in <laughs> within my <laughs> colleagues, and, and I was able to argue the case. That said, um, there, are, there is value to have an institutional view. And the word governance has, is, is an edgy word, because it's not really governance per se, but it's just being able to strategize together in what is the most cost-effective and efficient way of doing stuff. So for one example is we have a professor in computing science whose research is, is bioinformatics as well. And he wanted to buy a server. The, he had money in his research grant. He could do it. But he didn't know or wanted to manage the server, back it up, take care of all the antivirus and all this stuff that you need to do if you have a server. So, in having a conversation with us, we were able to say, OK, we actually have space in our data center. We, wanna, we can create a virtual server for you. It's part of our management process, so it's, it's of no cost to us because it's already there. We give you access. You have it there. It's backup. It's secure. You don't have to deal with it. And it's getting upgraded every five years, along with everything else in our data center. That was a really good deal. But that was. You know, for him, he needed to move past the, I don't want to give govern. You know, that there are guidelines. And, and part of what I would tell uh, uh, people in Trinity is that 
the policies that we establish in IT are not to harm you, but to help you and to protect you. So it's really like creating a fence in a playground. You know, you don't want your kids to be running crazy and onto the road. You know, the fences are there to protect them from themselves and others. But there is a very a lot of space in the playground for you to play with. And as long as you are able to, to express your needs as a researcher in an effective way so that, that you know, I'm sure almost every CIO I, that I have met are people who want to help you. You know, as this, uh, there are service providers and, and you know, uh, scientists like yourself and myself, you know, like uh, we are their customers and, and, you know, service providers want to help you. So if you are able to collaborate and become a partner with your IT department, what chances are that your solution is going to be better than what you even initially uh, identify yourself? Any more yes. Hi, Alma. Thanks for that. So you made reference to, uh, I think you said something about different versions of the truth and how o Osmar had spoken to uh, some of that stuff already. But can you speak to your own life experience, um, some real world examples from, from both the business side of your work and also the, uh, the university institutional side of your work where, where there was either the absence of uh, an acceptance of different versions of the truth and the kind of tensions that created or, or, or opportunities from having that acceptance that, that come with that? Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that uh, when I came in uh, four years ago, that, uh, that's when I became the CIO at Trinity Western. Um, they created the CIO role precisely because of this lack of uh, same versions of the truth. Everybody had a different truth. And unfortunately, our planning for budget of the university, because it's a private university, is highly dependent on the enrollment planning. So. Having different numbers and not really knowing how many students we have <laughs> is a terrible, terrible problem financially for the university, for our whole existence. It required us to, to be able to know this. And it is highly problematic not having a common area to identify where do we know exactly how many students we have head count because we have students that take summer courses so they're counted by extension and we have students who are really full-time students during the academic year but they're counted as full-time students but they're not two students it's one single one so he's not paying full tuition in both sides it's only one tuition that we're getting from this person so in, uh, in the same manner on the corporate side uh, that example that I, I was mentioning for uh, the, the fungi there were different research groups that uh, their, their whole goal is wanted to, to identify large families of fungi for pesticide development. However, different because they were working on different areas of the country, they had different uh, types of mushrooms. <laughs> and uh, they, their DNA, is that there, there seemed to be, if, if I look at the guys in BC, there was a species that was the most predominant one, so that was like the, the DNA. But in the larger stand of fungi across Canada, it really wasn't. It was, it was actually relatively small in comparison to other, other uh, types of fungi. So if I just were to work with the fungi from BC, we, uh, we would have a very good localized solution at BC. But it could not be extended further <laughs> past, you know, like British Columbia. So uh, it's there is value, though, sometimes to be able to do local analysis, and that's where I say it's, it's important to create that type of a strategy at the different levels, because sometimes there are certain areas that would be very, very valuable. An analysis similar to what uh, Osmar was showing in terms of the, of the telecommunications, how one customer could really impact a number of them. It's the same thing that happens in universities where one department, one person in the department is so incredibly influential. It's a, say it's, it's a large grant holder or a, a, a very popular professor at a department that is the high enrollment. Those are people that, if you don't keep them happy, <laughs> are going to affect the rest of the institution. If you, if you look localized, yes, yes that's one, one information, but to be able to, to assert the fact that it's impactful throughout the organization, you need to see the whole picture.
So our final, our final speaker for this session is Wade Ferguson, the Executive Director of the Vermilion Institute. Uh, Wade has been a business analyst and strategic consultant for nearly two decades. And through the Vermilion Institute, he's worked to identify the drivers of a sustainable economy Thank and you. to promote real and measured progress for people, the planet, and for prosperity. Uh, over many years, he studied the complexities in projects where big data and shared resources can be found profound, can have a profound regulatory and economic implication. And he's also examined how open projects have compensated for this factor. Uh, he's presented his findings internationally at the United Nations consultations and with groups as far away as London and Australia. And today, he's going to speak to us. Thank you very much, Russ. And I'd also like to thank Sibera for having me here. I'd like to thank Megan and, uh, and Robin for, for making the time and the schedule for me to appear for this. As I was originally uh, uh, invited to make this talk, I looked at the purpose for today's, uh, for, for this session, and it had to do with the pros and cons of open projects and the tensions that are involved. And while it's true that Vermillion's done a substantial amount of study into that because of the tensions that are involved in the sustainability space, uh, we'd never given this presentation before in the way that you're going to see it publicly, so I'll ask your forgiveness in advance for the reading off of some uh, cue cards here occasionally to make sure that I stay on track for information. So, what is Vermilion? Vermilion is a nonpartisan policy institute dedicated to advancing full spectrum sustainability, so that means people, planet, and prosperity, advancing that through data intensive research multi-stakeholder engagement and modern communication design. And you'll see how those various parts come together and the kind of tensions we're facing as well as the big data applications that we're looking to uh, enable. So to prepare for today, I did a survey last night of some of the people here to see how many are familiar with not just the concept of open projects, but also with the moving parts within them, the machinery that makes them all tick. And I've confirmed that there's a range of awareness, so my hope today is to arm the majority of you with the perspectives to better develop your own open projects for success. And I'm going to do that by comparing and contrasting the free knowledge models associated with the sustainability advocacy space, as well as in the software or access advocacy space. So I'd like to start with something I've been hearing for my entire life. There's an urgency to do something now, now, now. And the people who were working on this in the 1970s and 80s, they were expressing really important things about the risks to careless impacts on ecosystem services, social fabrics, and economic fa fabrics. And they were trying to raise, raise awareness of the need for sustainable management of three-dimensional, the, th the three, dimensionals of, three dimensions of sustainable development. Today there are no trusted global arbiters in this space because they didn't want that. They didn't want there to be a global bureaucracy stamping down on and, and delaying the expedited discovery of solutions and especially they didn't want such an organization stamping down on creative regional solution finding. And Alma and others have already talked about the importance for localizing solutions and making sure that they're right because they're not always applicable in different places. And the WeHub people later today are going to be talking about uh, uh, their work in water applications and big data in water and certainly water issues vary by region. It's really important to be able to not only look at the big picture but also to drill down into very, very important specific local elements. If we're being open, we need to recognize that the early sustainable development practitioners didn't have big communication budgets. So the only way that they could spread the word is to hope others would listen and take up the cause. That made them have to choose between decentralized networks or trying to get the public or sponsors to pay for their, their content, which was the only other commonly available distribution model. And around the same time in the early 1980s, another growing community, the open access software community, was also trying to spread its knowledge through a laissez-faire approach. In the cases of the software people, a guy named Richard Stallman, who later founded the Free Software Foundation, was giving his code away for free with great intentions. He wanted to spread the code far and wide, so eventually a deep body of tools would be available to everyone. And he wanted to keep things easy for himself and the people he was giving the software to, so he didn't attach any copyright rules for the use of what he created. But then he encountered instances where companies he gave the code to improved on it, but then they refused to share alike by giving the improvements back to the community. 
After that happened a number of times to Richard, he coined the term software hoarding. And he later solved the problem by beginning to leverage the copyright laws he had previously devalued. So instead of having people pay for the license with cash, they really pay for it with sort of an IOU to license the improvements back to the larger community on similar terms. And in the same time frame, sustainable development people also started to see their ideas being taken, redefined, repackaged into proprietary systems and used in different ways. And they were probably happy to see others develop their own selfish reasons to talk about sustainability. So from their point of view, not all fragments were bad. So today we see Energy Star, Green Seal, Green Guard, Cradle to Cradle. Consumers now have this wealth of environmentally focused messages and socially focused messages to decipher. To people who work deeply in this space, the distinctions between these are clear. But to most people, most of the public, right over their heads. There's some controversy about whether these marks are as good as they should be, as rigorous as they should be, as g at giving tools to consumers to recognize better products, better companies. And we see that the people who created many of the tr early trust marks were doing so with integrity and seriousness of purpose. But by not managing the value in their intellectual property, they enabled a wide range of competing groups to emerge, which made things so much more difficult. It's got to the point where some companies are, are gaming the system by labeling themselves with terms that they've created. Market forces don't work when buyers can't tell the difference and don't know what to trust. Companies that lead the world, some of them here in Alberta, that lead the world in their sectors and responsibility across the three dimensions of sustainable development, don't get many market advantages from these kind of systems. And now some orgs are being funded to go into open and multi-stakeholder projects to distort the discussions, distort the outcomes, and distort the market in favor of narrow spe special interests. And in the absence of any globally or nationally trusted arbiters in, in better systems for veracity, as, as Osmar, Osmar was talking about earlier, many questions can't get settled, which put many, many regions and industry at substantial risk. And from a big data point of view, all of these systems ask questions in different ways, so companies answer the questions about workplace safety rates, carbon, water, uh, jobs in the community. They answer them in different ways, creating a universe of data that's uneconomic to get to, translate, mine, refine, delaying the time by which we get to better information that would inform uh, what an industry leader looks like, what could be scaled, and other, uh, other people in the same industry could follow along in order to still be profitable as they improve their impacts, and importantly, delaying the time that we get to better, more constructive public policy. Again, Osmar and, Osmar and uh, Alma did a really great job of talking about the difficulties in the data translation, so you folks can already imagine what we're talking about here with so many hundreds of organizations collecting the data and being substantially under-resourced, many of them themselves that are trying to do a good job of this. Don't let this happen to your open project. If you're working on something without any foreseeable political or economic implications, maybe, you know, conventional, conventional open source software or GNU kind of license is good enough. But increasingly, universities are being asked to tackle projects that deal with commercial applications. So you're, if you're an academic or a government agency, hoping to use an open model to get to the bottom of questions that, that will inform, uh, uh, inform outcomes that relate to public and business interests, there are better blueprints for sharing data and info, information that lead to creative collaboration and continual process improvement, not the kind of chaos that we see in the sustainable development space. So let's take a look at the modern spectrum of knowledge development. So we've got a free-for-all on the one side, closed development on the other, and open access, rule-based communities that Richard Stallman and others have refined over time. Vermillion considers this range in the middle to be the sweet spot, where depending upon your needs, you can pick the right mix to get the job done. On the left, we've got open source software and exchanges like that, the GNU license that so many are familiar with. And on the other side, we've got multi-stakeholder consortiums. So in a close-up on the laissez-faire side, the GNU license doesn't generate cohesive communities, but it does widen the field of available shared resources. And if that's all, you, if that's all your project needs, you may be good to go with something like that. But when you need to generate adherence, you'll need something more. 
So in a close-up on the cohesion side, let's take a look at cross-licensing systems like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, XBRL, and Alberta's own TR Labs. By a show of hands, how many people here could describe to their neighbors how Bluetooth became the leader in short-range wireless communications in less than a year? How was that possible? I think I saw one hand go up about who could, who could uh, explain to their neighbor. So many assume it was like 30 years ago with VHS and beta, and they would have assumed that before I said what I just said, that they just fought it out in the marketplace until somebody won. But in the last days of beta, when fewer and fewer movies were, were being made in that format, many of those systems ended up being thrown out before the end of their useful lives. And as a sustainability organization, we see that as a resource inefficient way of, of uh, managing product cycles. And in a similar vein, in regions where cell phone towers were not regulated 25 years ago, we saw competing cell services select CDMA, TDMA, GSM uh, broadcast formats because it made, frankly, it made it harder for their customers to switch to a competitor if their phone wouldn't be compatible on the competitor's towers. When people did switch, they knew it would be wasteful. They, they were reluctant to do it, so it didn't happen as often as it would have happened in, an, in, a, in a, a more healthy competitive space. Bottom line is, it was extremely wasteful for all those devices that did get thrown away in advance of their useful life. And it raised the cost, and it raised the cost to sell manufacturers to have to build three different versions of the same phone, and it really didn't give consumers any kind of better quality as a result of that, that style of competition. So flash forward to 15 years ago, and cell makers didn't want a repeat of that. They didn't want there to be a, an extended, uh, costly fight that was going to play out over years or decades for the next big technolog technological investment, investment, which would be how your cell phone or other devices interoperate with other devices through the air th with ones and zeros. So they so to their credit, oh, I'm just going to say a, a few more words about that. Can you imagine having to decide between throwing away your phone or throwing away your car when the devices are incompatible and you want hands-free dialing? <laughs> And can you imagine a world where each automaker would have had to put three different chips and middleware into their car in order to cover whatever, their cell phone, whatever cell phones their customers or their future customers might happen to use? What a waste that would have been. To the credit of four companies, they got together and said, we don't want that kind of chaos here. We want something better for ourselves and for consumers. They didn't necessarily want you know, all that problem of government regulation, so they created something called the Bluetooth Special Interest Group and began a multi-stakeholder consortium to get to a private regulation system that would streamline things for every, everybody. So they went out to their friends for the first six months behind closed doors and they, pour, and, and they invited them to join this group. The moment they joined the group, they were automatically what's called cross-licensed with all the patent and copyright they would need to build similar devices based on what they were currently working out. They poured a lot of money, they poured uh, lots and lots of money, lots and lots of times in a sort of a mini me mega project into this. So at the end of six months, they kind of had something that, that, that was stable and workable for, for, for more people. And then they opened it up to everybody. Anybody that wanted to join could join with a nominal annual subscription of, of money and time to contribute to making it better over time. And they democratized access to the decision cycles that went with, with adding new features to Bluetooth over time. There were 40 by the end of six months. There were 400 by the end of the year, and it was over. Bluetooth was the leader in short-range wireless communications. Bluetooth took a space that was about to have highly vested interest on various sides and low agreement about how the market would operate, and converted it in less than a year into a space with high agreement about how the market would operate, and, and serving a much wider range of, of, of shared interests. And we think that's good. The key time in the development of Bluetooth was the first six months when they poured all that time and money and into building a solid platform that others could believe in and benefit from. And this created a kind of artificial gravity that brought all the other device manufacturers into orbit around so that they would ultimately land or dock with, uh, with the Bluetooth special interest group and, and, and work within the codes of conduct and licensing terms of, of building that shared, re shared resource for everybody. What does this mean to you? Well, for your open projects, we encourage you to look around. If you find another group that's got an open project like the one that you want to start, and if they're already doing it well, join them rather than creating more fragmentation, increasing the costs to everyone, and reducing the applicability to everyone. Now, many open practitioners feel that projects stop being open when groups charge participation fees. 
Those that think that are going to want to send angry emails or letters, and I encourage you to do so, and they should be sent to uh, Megan and Robin at Cybera. <laughs> Look, free, free doesn't mean free of charge. It means free of access so everyone can access it on reasonable terms. It means that keeping the costs down to lower the barriers to entry so that more data and people can come. As I said earlier, there were 400 by the end of the first year, 4,000 by the end of four years, 12,000 by the end of 10 years, and today I think there are 16,000 members of the Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth group, which means as more and more of them joined, on a sliding scale, so small companies pay lower subscriptions than large companies, but importantly, as more join and contribute to making it better, the costs of each of them participating actually go down because they're operating on a cost recovery basis. Communities on the spectrum cease being open in the real world when they no longer have the goals to enable wide access, when they start looking like professional associations, law, medicine, accounting, that limit the number of participants, or that have significantly high barriers to entry, like you have to have six or 10 years under your belt before you get to, be, get to become a professional practitioner. So in our case, how do we fix this? What did we have to think about? What can Vermilion do to try and help with the excessive splintering in the sustainable development space? Well, Vermilion wants to create and has looked for ways to create our own kind of artificial gravity to help stakeholders connect and cooperate, observe, observe orderly, and data, orderly discussions and data collection guidelines along the way. Our goal is to find better answers to people, planet, and prosperity questions that matter to communities here and abroad. We do that in a number of ways. One is something we call the Vermilion Web. We wanted to find a way, we wondered what it would look like with all of these groups fighting on either side of issues. What would it look like to create a financially sustainable organization that could find consensus where it can be found and then inexpensively broadcast that information through partner networks and low cost digital communications. We looked at proprietary systems from IBM and Microsoft for collaboration software. We ultimately, we ultimately settled on, on a series of open source tools. And Scott Style, who's the vice chair of Vermilion, uh, was, was instrumental in not only looking at the, the data collection algorithms that relate to some of the, the real and measurable uh, outcomes that we want to be better, better, get to better understanding around, but he was also involved in, in pulling down the original open source tools that, and extending that went together into what you're about to see. So there were already tools available. There are already tools available uh, through open, in open source libraries for three-dimensional visualizations. We want to, of course, apply them to helping stakeholders look at uh, visualizations of people, planet, and prosperity data and talk about what it all means. And having arrived at consensus to be able to have better online presentations to broadcast those, 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 uh, those agreements into low bandwidth settings, rural, rural, rural areas, Aboriginal communities, so more people can follow along and understand uh, the, 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 the good news about elevating people, planet, and prosperity and sustainable development. As more mo money and more time becomes available to us, we want to enhance search functions to meta tag and also have adjacent kinds of data available associated with the, the data that we're collecting so that we can make people, help people better collect with the data that's relevant to their regions. Another one of the things we're doing to try and create this artificial gravity is by working with the Innovators in Sustainability Project. Uh, which is also working with the International Society of Sustainability Professionals. And in the very first three months of this project, I'll, I'll speak about that more in just a moment, our goal initially is in five to seven industries to work with industry and NGOs to identify in retailing, utilities, forestry, chemistry, agriculture, what real and measurable success looks like, try and get to that consensus and also broadcast it and also begin to collect that data. So we wanted to make something really attractive, and I'm playing on the word artificial gravity when I say attract, attractive, attracting, to attract the various groups that we would want to have uh, join us in initial pilot program of the Innovators and in Sustainability Project. Oh, if I didn't say it already, I just wanted to say Scott Style, who helped to develop the Vermilion web platform, is also working on the Lindsay project now. And later today, you're going to have a great presentation from Christian, who is, uh, I believe, the executive director of the Lindsay project, which is to model the human body and visualize it for predictive and educational applications. So that's going to be a really good presentation. You probably want to check that out. And Scott's uh, one, of the, one of the lead developers on that. So when it, when it comes to these guys and artificial gravity, 
If we can, we're going to try and encourage the best of these to begin taking a more orderly approach to the data collection and to reward them and strengthen them in a number of ways that helps attract them to the, to the conversation, while also trying to weaken some of their frivolous uh, competitors through reduced adoption of those logos. And if we achieve that, we'll have done something pretty good there as well. So this is a big task to undertake. But evidence is that we're beginning to make progress in this because in the first three months of the project, we had people tune into our content from over 30 countries, uh, starting in declining viewership, starting at the top with the United States and Canada, Germany, France, and down the list to Brazil, Ireland, Sweden, and more, more since then, tuning in uh, with a view to learning more about a constructive view of, uh, of, 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 of what leadership looks like for people, planet, and community prosperity. We certainly faced obstacles, continue to face obstacles. For instance, some NGO groups are, are so used to the laissez-faire approach that they feel that the, the kind of rule-based approach we're taking to how they might use our assets and our tools that we're creating is kind of cramping their style. But just like Bluetooth, we work with the people who are ready to go now and we build our community as we go. In a larger strategic presentation, I speak more about how Vermillion is creating artificial gravity systems to begin to generate the cohesion that's lacking. But given today's time constraints, I'm going to leave it at that. And if you like what you see, we invite you to look through and ask questions. Thank you. Extremely well timed. Pretty big initiatives, pretty big ideas. Do you need it? Um, pretty big initiatives, pretty big ideas. What's your funding sources? So Vermillion has been self-funded to the tune of, of close to $500,000 now by our founders and volunteer directors and a series of advisors and, and interested parties who are sus generally sustainable development uh, professionals and or IT professionals that have seen the need for to, to increase cohesion and reduce the fragmentation. We haven't received any funding from government agencies or, or industry. Well, I want to take that back. A large financial services company in, in Ontario was kind enough to help us get to a UN consultation we had been invited to uh, leading up to Rio Plus 20. So aside from that contribution, the Institute hasn't seen any industry funding or provincial funding or, or federal funding. So I have, I have a question. Thank you. I sense that the theme um, between Alma's talk and your talk that uh, you feel that part of the solution to the big data deluge is, is governance and regulation. Um, I, I wonder if you just speak philosophically on that point of how, how you see that being part of the umbrella or, or, or our diversity of, of um, approaches that need to be taken to dealing with big data. Well, I think uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, it's some that question about who we get funding from. We get that question a lot. We don't get your question a lot. So thank you. Um, so I think there are two sides. Again, there are you know proprietary systems which are and and Elma's referred to uh, un setting in a university or setting in a company where there is a, a you know strict hierarchical structure that can kind of insist on things and and sometimes they'll create an effective benevolent dictator that can both that can both uh, listen and then take in you know different points of view and process that for the the greater good of the entire organization. Sometimes not. Uh, but then there are these decentralized multi-stakeholder groups. And so, so I think most of us are familiar with the top-down model. And I think your question about the philosophical elements of, of the governance deal more with the, 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 the multi-stakeholder settings. So you know, having you know, split that out for clarity, uh, I think you know, smarter people than me have written good essays about, about the very topic you've just said. And I'd like to refer people who are, who are watching online or here to actually look at some of the essays written by Richard Stallman of the uh, Free Software Foundation. And one of the points that he makes is, because he's sometimes criticized, well, you know, by setting up these rules for access to the software, uh, access to the open software, you're kind of excluding some people who, you know, won't agree to that. And he's like, well, no, actually the opposite is the case. They're choosing not to join our community. 
They're choosing not to join a community where, where the, the very terms of engagement are that you will help make it better and stronger over time and deeper and richer. And if, you, if they choose not to join, well then we will build with the people that want to join and, and work on those terms. And so, so uh, certainly, you know, things like Chatham House Rule and, and, and some of the very governance models associated and seen in Bluetooth are things that inspired some of what we work with in our information exchange. For instance, um, Bluetooth, because competitors come together in the Bluetooth working groups, there's a, there are provisions associated with what they call in the United States, what we call in Canada, competition law, so that you know competitors won't talk about market share or price levels or a series of things that could get themselves in Bluetooth on the wrong side of regulatory considerations. And so part of what we had to think through along the philosophical lines of governance wasn't just you know how do we help folks, you know, can't we all just get along, but also how do we also stay compliant within a series of, of regulatory frames that exist not just in Canada but around the world as we, as we work through this. Uh, did that get to your question? It's, it's, sir, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Uh, if not, then I'd like to ask to thank all of our speakers for this session. And we are ending just about on time. Uh, I think the next thing on the agenda is lunch uh, at Vistas, and for which I believe you have a, a little lunch ticket in your, in your kit. So back at uh, what time? 1.30. PowerPoint. Oh, just the background PowerPoint we normally use.